That. What I want to do uh, is also frame this uh, for the general public as well as the council as to really what brought us to this particular situation. Uh, I had engaged independently uh, for a little over a week now as the mayor of this community, uh, really making my views known on this particular measure and steps that I felt were appropriate for me as the mayor to take. As further developments of this particular bill continue daily to evolve and other implications continue to rise to the surface, particularly that of the possibility of the complete dismantling of our transit system by the evaporation of collective bargaining here in the state, I felt it definitely a requirement to bring this in front of the Common Council uh, to be able to debate the issue uh, of specifically opposing certain provisions of the proposed budget adjustment bill. You know, if we, as we've watched this unfold, we've really obviously now gained national attention in terms of this issue on the collective bargaining matter. But more importantly than that is there's been a distortion out of this governor's office, Governor Scott Walker, specifically talking about what mayors and municipal leaders have asked for in terms of tools throughout the state of Wisconsin. And the concern that I have had, and as I continue to hear uh, this administration talk about the tools necessary, quote, that the mayors asked for, we needed to make it very clear that what we asked for, which I have right here in front of me, which are very specific, flexible changes to collective bargaining and not the complete evaporation of it, which is what the governor really does want to move forward with uh, in reference to this particular proposed budget adjustment bill. This is not what municipal leaders through the League of Wisconsin Municipalities has asked for. And Dan Thompson, our executive director, has made that very, very clear uh, to the governor and the legislature. What we asked for was flexibility and tools within the current collective bargaining law to help us better address the obvious reductions that we are going to face as a municipality. We understand that. We understand that we have to be a part of that solution. And flexibility, indeed, is the way in which we'll work through those challenges. But the difficult part for us now is, especially as we look at the transit situation that we face, uh, with no real answers coming out of the legislature, there were a multitude of amendments that were introduced today to save and actually exempt transit from this particular bill. They failed on a party line vote. That was confirmed with Representative Malepsky roughly a half hour ago. So we stand at a situation where, in its current form and in its current fashion, that this bill is simply unacceptable, I feel, uh, to the city of Stevens Point and what we stand for here and how we could better and more cooperatively work through the fiscal challenges that the state faces right now. Uh, the situation that we face with transit is of the most dire situation. Dire has been used in terms of um, ultimately uh, consequences that are revolving around Madison. Well, this indeed would be one of, the most dis one of the most disastrous changes in our public services that we would have ever experienced as a municipality. The least fortunate in our community would be affected the most, egregiously, uh, the most egregiously with this in us not being able to have flexibility and mobility. Last year alone, we had over 250,000 rides steadily increasing our ridership with public transit here in the city by 5 to 6% every single year. We are, in essence, telling the elderly that we don't care uh, that you're not going to be able to get to and from your appointments. The most important aspect of public transit that would be eliminated, of course, is disability mobility. Uh, disabled mobility, that's something that we have to be able to maintain. And this particular bill, in its current form, if passed without any changes, uh, would render it nearly impossible for us to continue with public transit. Unless we went through other measures that would become, uh, in essence, privatized or finding some kind of a private entity, that would still leave it up to the U.S. Department of Labor's discretion as to whether or not they would approve that. So with that being said, this is certainly at a situation where I don't feel that we can sit back on the sidelines and let this progress uh, without us addressing it officially, and I feel addressing it in a way that opposes the current fashion. We, uh, and I want to thank Alderperson Wiesa, quite frankly, for um, stepping forward and submitting the draft that he did to us. We used the basis of that um, for the resolution that we modified here today, but we changed a very important whereas, which was the first one. And the first one is something that is very, very important uh, that we'll be able to talk about. It says that we recognize the financial situation that the state is in. And in essence, we make it very clear that we want to be able to be a flexible and cooperative partner in working with the state to solve their financial issues. That's, I think, very, very important. We, we don't in any way, shape, or form in the resolution that we'll talk about under agenda item two, we in no way, shape, or form say that we aren't ready to be at the table, that we aren't ready to work through these issues, that we aren't ready to take changes in shared revenue. And in essence, that's what these legislative priorities that I helped draft as a director of the board of directors of the League of Wisconsin Municipalities, we made that very clear. We need changes 
We don't need elimination of collective bargaining. We need changes to it to help us get through a difficult time. Those are indeed the exact phrases that we used in determining the use of the word tools. The use of the word tools to help local municipalities emanated from the League's legislative priorities. Unfortunately, the governor has taken that and said that the tools are going to be a chainsaw as opposed to a scalpel. We asked for a scalpel and that's not what we're getting in this particular bill. And unfortunately, the ancillary implications of a bill that really is going now through a time, quite frankly, because of the leadership of the 14 senators that got away so we could actually slow down and analyze this, are being revealed more and more every day. And the specific threat to transit that we now face is what put me over the edge in terms of calling for this special common council meeting. I do not want or like the idea of politicizing the Common Council. That is not the intent and not the reason for doing this. The intent is this particular bill would have such disastrous effects on the city's service level delivery that we simply can't sit back on the sidelines. So with that we will move on to agenda. Oh, I do want to make sure that anyone that is in the audience, uh, if you would sign in on the sheet back there. This is going to be a conversation specifically for the council, uh, but if you would there is a sign up sheet. Please sign in. Uh, let us know who you are and if you're representing anyone and uh, we'll move on to agenda item two, which is consideration of resolution opposing provisions in the proposed budget adjustment bill. You have that before you. Yes, Alderperson Mallison. I would move approval of the resolution opposing provisions in the proposed budget uh, adjustment bill. And if I have a second, I'd like to make some comments. Okay, is there a second? Seconded by Alderperson Brooks. Mr. Mallison, you have the floor. Well, first, before I start speaking on this issue, I want to disclose a few things. I want to disclose the fact that I am a United Steel worker. I want to disclose the fact that I have been a delegate to the Central Labor Council. I got it down. Uh, I'd like to thank the mayor for coming out over a week ago uh, against this budget repair bill. And I'd also like to thank the older person, Wiza, for coming forward with his, his uh, resolution as well. Uh, but now it's time for this legislative body to act. And uh, though I believe that having uh, union members pay more in health insurance and pension is needed. I don't believe it is warranted to this extent or this quickly. Uh, but what I can't stand for is the changes to collective bargaining. This is a thug-like tactic being used by the government, by the governor, to destroy unions and weaken the middle class. I think a lot of people that were remembering what Governor Walker talked about when he ran remember about his brown bag. And I think a lot of people are figuring out what this brown bag is full of because this bill stinks. And that's why I'm going to be voting in favor of this. And I'll be proud if this passes to accompany the mayor to Madison tomorrow to deliver this to the state legislators and hopefully to the governor's office itself. Okay. Mr. Brooks, do you want to speak to your second? Yes, please. Um, I, too, have a, a, a direct interest in this, of course, being a teacher. And um, I know it was about a week ago that, uh, Mr. Mayor, you and I were just discussing uh, flirt with the idea of resolution a week ago and I'm glad to see it's coming up to us uh, coming in front of the council now today um, but as a as a teacher um, obviously I stand to lose thousands on this but it's not about the money and I've, I've been one of the few I guess when I when I sit around all my colleagues and see how aggressive they are against this I've been one of the few who sat tight lip because I, I believe that we do need to do our part uh, not just state employees, but everyone do their part when there's a, a, a situation such as we're having in our state with the deficit we have. However, I don't think it, I think it's been clear as we progress through this, the information we've gathered, that it's no longer about simply uh, balancing the, a deficit with our state. Now it's simply become an attack, I think, on unions, on the middle class, and on democracy altogether. And I'm glad that a resolution itself indicates that it's n we're not standing for uh, n we're not saying that we don't want to um, give in and do our part in fact it's it states that we we will gladly do so but we'd like to extend that period to stretch it out so it makes it, it makes it easier for us to adjust to it um, in in the collective bargaining is one of the biggest uh, beefs I have with the proposal right now because it, it goes beyond the, just the deficit and I think that proves it. Now, um, it, now speaking in terms of someone who sits on the city council and has to face this, we know the difficulties we've had in balancing our own city budget the past couple of years and we know that the harmful effects this is going to have on on our budget with the city and the more creative we're going to have to be with of course finding funds to to maintain the the uh, 
the quality of life that we have in the city and the resources and um, wonderful roads and, and, and uh, machinery and everything else we were able to afford um, and to be able to maintain those things over the next few years. Just as a point of order, I want to make it noted that we do have a full council, uh, Alderpersons M. Stroik and Alderperson Moore uh, and Mr. Slowinski are here with us as well. Mr. Trebateski? Well, as we, you know, I, I think as a lot of us in the uh, city government have known, uh, we've been talking about the economic impact. And I see, you know, one of the provisions in here uh, in the resolution itself talks about the $14 million um, of, of direct impact that is going to result from this. Uh, that only represents the $14 million or $13.9 million that the employees will be contributing to the Wisconsin retirement system. It doesn't take into account a lot of the insurance and other payments that will be a result of this. And as most um, economists will use, they'll use a multiplier effect because the hand will change, the money will change <coughs> time over time again. Whether they're shopping, um, you know, in stores, go, buying groceries, buying necessities for life, or cars, or whatever, or perhaps even suits, as I said the other night. I mean, it, you never know. It, it will trickle down and trickle down rapidly. So we could, you know, a lot of economists will use a factor of 10. So this 14 million that we will feel directly can easily become $140 million of, of negative ec economic impact against the city of Stevens Point or Portage County. Um, you know, another point that I would like to make, which we were, you know, just made aware of today, is on page five of, of the bill. And on there, it says this bill requires the Secretary of Employee Trust Funds to allocate $28 million from reserve accounts established in the Public Employee Trust Fund for group health and pharmacy benefits for state employees to reduce employer costs, meaning the state, for providing group health insurance for state employees for the period beginning on July 1, 2011 and ending December 31st, 2011. So basically what they're doing is taking the employee money already invested, taken out of the fund, paying the state's portion, and I mean, that's it, uncomprehensible. I, I, I just can't see how the uh, governor, you know, can, can even consider such things in his bill. And that's why we have our 14 senators out, you know, boycotting basically, trying to give us the time. And every time we read, you know, the, especially the first seven pages of this 144 page bill, you find more and more and more and more buried into it. And, uh, you know, as, as several of my consti or, uh, counterparts here have already said, that, that's why I'm voting in favor of this resolution as well. And, and I hope that uh, either the clerk or the mayor will read the resolution in its entirety, um, you know, for the public out there. Sure. In, in fact, while we're doing that, why don't we go ahead and, and take care of that. Whereas the city of Stevens Point recognizes the financial situation which exists in the state of Wisconsin and is willing to cooperate with the state of Wisconsin to remedy the situation. And whereas among Wisconsin's great assets as a state are the public employees who work hard to provide the essential services and infrastructure for the people and businesses of Wisconsin to thrive. And whereas the state of Wisconsin and its governmental employees have established an extensive history of progressive advancement of public employees and their resulting work product. And whereas the city of Stevens Point has experienced long history of productive relationships with our public employees and our public unions, which is reflected in the recent police union settlement securing a 0% increase in wages for the year of 2011. And whereas the state budget adjustment legislation proposed by Governor Walker would prohibit any local governmental unit from collectively bargaining with its employees except for public safety employees and collective bargaining rights under current law would be effectively retained for public safety employees only. And whereas, with over 4,300 public sector employees in Portage County, the estimated cuts in take-home pay from the budget repair bill would be $3,149, or a net loss of almost $14 million to our local works uh, and economy. And whereas, prohibiting the provisions of current law regarding collection of union dues and certification of unions would assist neither the state of Wisconsin nor the city of Stevens Point in addressing current and future budget challenges. And whereas, the city of Stevens Point employs transit workers for its transit system and under Section 5333 Sub B of Title 49 of the United States Code effectively requires the city to continue collective bargaining rights that existed 
at the time of the initial federal assistance or potentially lose the annual federal funds in the amount of $782,000 per year. The city of Stevens Point would further lose state revenue in the amount of $299,000, which would effectively eliminate the city's transit system and require certain payments to be made to its discharged employees. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Stevens Point Common Council hereby request that the state legislature delete the provisions of the fiscal repair bill currently being considered that pertain to collective bargaining and that the said items be given separate consideration with public hearings, legislative committee markup, and deliberations in each house of the legislature. Be it further resolved that issues relating to health insurance and retirement be phased in over a period of 24 months for public employees of the state of Wisconsin and that municipal shared revenue reductions be made over a 24-month period of time as well. Be it further resolved that the City of Stevens Point stands in solidarity with the hardworking men and women of the public sector and thanks them for their invaluable contribution to our community. That's the resolution before you. <coughs> Any other comments or questions? Yes, Mr. Moore, followed by Mr. Wiesa. I don't appreciate getting this in the last minute. I've heard conflicting news reports over the transit section of this and have been trying to find the answers to them this morning. And until I can find those answers for myself with an unbiased opinion and direct and in words that will be clear to which way this goes, I am not going to support this resolution at this time. Yes, we apologize, obviously, for the short notice. But given the, the speed with which the legislature is acting, we obviously have no choice. Mr. Wiesa. Uh, first of all, some disclosures. I'm not a union employee, but I do work for a living. Uh, the reason I asked the mayor to, to hold this special meeting to consider the resolution that I had drafted um, was because I didn't see anything formal coming out of the, the that office or of this group um, even with our comments uh, opportunities at the council meeting on Monday nothing formal was coming out of it I had been working on the draft and to address uh, Alderman Moore's questions I did the research on what I drafted um, so I'm confident in those numbers. I'm for a balanced budget in Wisconsin and for spending within our means at state and local levels. On this issue, the unions need to meet the financial requests of the governor and they've agreed to do so. One of the whereases that uh, the mayor added talks about the 0% increase. Now it's time for the governor to come a little closer. Collective bargaining has absolutely nothing to do with balancing this budget. Um, I do have some questions, um, but before I do, I want to formally thank the mayor for honoring my request to have this special meeting and consider my resolution. Now, there are some changes um, that you had made or city attorney, someone had made uh, with what was presented to us tonight, slightly different than mine, um, adding a few things that, as Mr. Moore said, I'm not comfortable in, in knowing. So I talked to the city attorney. And I do have some questions. Can you basically explain, uh, Mr. Attorney, what the whereas regarding the transit system is? Section 533 sub B, Title 49. And the wording here says potentially lose annual federal funds. What, what would cause us to lose those funds? Okay. Uh, for the record, I put that particular paragraph in. And <clears throat> the reason being is this. I had the opportunity to review the uh, Legislative Fiscal Bureau, which is the independent uh, body uh, of the state of Wisconsin, which reviews and analyzes all bills that are in, in the legislature so that legislators, frankly, can uh, have the opportunity to know exactly what's happening with, with a particular uh, piece of legislation. There are two attachments with this. This one's dated February 16th, 2011. Um, and um, it's from Mr. Al Rundy, a fiscal analysis written to one of the uh, state assembly persons. Uh, <clears throat> in a nutshell, uh, I might read a portion of what Dr. John Lund uh, who is the director of the Office of Labor Management Standards in the U.S. Department of Labor, which is an attachment to this. This letter is written to Al Rundy from the Legislative Fiscal Bureau of the State Legislature. Uh, 
The following is, your, is a response to your request yesterday for information regarding the Department of Labor's uh, certification of Federal Transit Administration grants. When federal funds are used to acquire, improve, operate a transit system, federal law requires arrangements to protect the rights of affected trans transit employees. These arrangements must be approved by the Department of Labor before the Department of Transportation's Federal Transit Administration can release funds to the grantees. The terms and conditions of the protected agreements are included in the grantees contract with the FTA. The requirement to protect transit employees is contained in Section 5333B of Title 49 of the US, United States Code. Uh, Section 533B, Pren 2, specifies that arrangements must be provided, number one, the pre preservation of rights and benefits of employees under the existing collective bargaining agreement or otherwise. Continuation of collective continuation of collective bargaining rights. C, protection of individual employees against worsening of their positions in relationship to their employment. D, assurances of employment to employees of acquired transit systems. And I'll go back and explain what we're into on that. And E, priority of reemployment and pay training or retraining programs. Section 13C requires governing bodies to continue, quote, collective bargaining rights that existed at the time of the initial influx of federal assistance. In the past, some states have been prohibited, uh, have prohibited public sector collective bargaining, have ensured continuation of collective bargaining rights by a, quote, Memphis plan, where the transit authority contracts with the management company to operate the system, hire the employees, thus maintaining the private sector rights of the employees. If changes in state law affect the collective bargaining rights employees enjoyed at the initial influx of the federal assistance, alternative employee protections may be required to address these changes. The need for alternative protections would be addressed in the context of a pending grant application. This does not preclude the parties from addressing this issue in advance of the pending uh, application. Now, I'll, in effect, if uh, this is a five-page memo, and to summarize it, uh, number one, if the bargaining rights are taken away from the transit employees uh, as such, and we, that is the city, then made an application for transit monies, we would not receive them because of the fact that um, we can no longer afford bargaining rights through the state under this act to these individual employees. We would have to create, as, as the note indicates, a separate agency which would have to run the bus system and fund it in that type of fashion, assuming that we're allowed to do that under this particular statute. And I can't say we are after reading the uh, legislative uh, uh, report. I will say this. If, for example, we do not receive the 800 and 800 odd thousand dollars, I don't remember the exact amount, uh, and Remember, a portion of that state money, as the fiscal letter will indicate, uh, that the state receives comes from the feds, which, which has those conditions attached to it. Uh, we wouldn't have the money, frankly, to operate this system. Now, if the system goes out of business, under those contracts and grants that we have received and signed with the government, that is the federal government, we are obligated, we would probably be obligated to pay a portion of the monies back or purchase in effect that we received for, say, a bus garage and things such as that. 
but that's only the tip of the iceberg. If this goes out of business, I can't remember as I sit here if it's three or five years, but under the law, we're required to employ, excuse me, we are, we are required to pay to the drivers. I don't remember how many transit drivers we have, eight, nine, ten, something like that. Um, their salary and benefits out of our pocket for the next three years. And it may be five, and I apologize for not having that. I didn't have a chance to go through that. But that is the law. It's, the, it's been the law, and we're well aware of that when we went into this some um, 25 years ago. Okay, further clarification. Uh, boy, too many questions. The, we're required to pay three to five years of salary. Why? Because uh, the transit workers under that Transit Act <clears throat> were protected. First of all, they had, they were grant, we have to, as Dr. Lund indicates, we must continue those rights to those particular employees, whether we employ them or we're going to use a Memphis plan to try to continue to employ, employ them and have some third party or third entity run that uh, operation for us. As part of the initial grants, we agreed that if we, after the government gave us the, the million dollars approximately or more a year to run this and operate this transit, we agreed that we would, in the event we discontinued totally this operation and in effect discharged the employees, that we would continue their salary for those three years. Okay, um, early on you mentioned that, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, there was mention that we would have to... You mentioned that we would have to um, potentially create a separate entity to run the transit facility if we were to, lose, or to avoid losing those funds. Is this something that we can do similar to what we do with the water department? where we would have, you know, point transit be a separate entity? I, as I started to say, I don't know how that bill is going to affect us in that regard. Frankly, I have not read all, what is it, 144 pages as it relates to that and cross-referenced everyone. And even though I do have a legislative um, report on it from the our local representative, frankly, I have, I just got back in town and I haven't had the chance to sit down and read the whole thing as of this point. But um, I will say this, there, there is a statute as it relates to um, transit authorities and the like, I, you know, and I haven't looked at that in eons. Okay, but you're confident that your research under that whereas um, is, has convinced you to a significant extent that we are likely yeah, to lose that federal funding and that a consequence of that may or may not be the elimination of our public transportation system. Is that correct? I'm, yes, I'm saying that if this bill goes through and eliminates collective bargaining and all the associated rights of, of municipal employees along with the state employees, then we would not be eligible to obtain these funds from um, the United States or the federal government uh, unless we were to create a separate transit authority which would contract with the management company, for example, to operate the system and hire the workers, and that company would be bound by the same rules of collective bargaining that we are as of today, and as of the day they entered into it. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that was one of the things that was added um, to the resolution that I had proposed. 
The other thing was the second, be it further resolved, uh, the issues that relating are relating to health insurance and retirement being phased out over 24 months for public employees and the shared revenue reductions also be phased out over 24 months. Um, I know the mayor had made mention of that, that we stand the possibility to lose between 30, uh, 10 and 30 percent of shared revenue. The original resolution that I had drafted had nothing in there in regards to uh, the employees phasing out that health insurance uh, and retirement contribution over 24 months. Um, I think that the employees should do their part just like everybody else has been doing their part. Um, they've made concessions already, at least in the city of Stevens Point, uh, with the contracts that we have currently settled. My specific beef was with the elimination of collective bargaining. Uh, we did not need to do anything regarding collective bargaining to balance this budget. Uh, and that's what I stood by. I will, um, while though I, I'm, I'm not too hot on the idea, with reservations regarding that second, be it further resolved, uh, I will be in favor of this. I do want to point out that uh, on the first page, we had a reference to a footnote that's missing from this resolution. So either take out the reference to the footnote or add the footnote in. Um, other than that, the other thing I'd like to ask for, Mayor, you pointed out that you have, uh, from the League of Municipalities, was that what you had asked for in regards to uh, helping balance the budget or changes that you wanted to see? That document that you had in your hand earlier. I'd like a copy of that, please. You can get it from the League's website. It's their legislative priorities. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Shrebatusky. Uh, actually, excuse me, Mr. Strike. Um, yes, th this is a tough resolution for me, and um, with all due respect to Mr. Weasel, I, I disagree with his comments completely, and um, regarding the mayor's office not dealing with this. As the executive branch, I know you have been dealing with this because we've talked about this several times. So that dialogue would have brought that to fruition for Mr. Weza. I feel for the first time as a city council, we are elected to be independent and to not politicize local government. And I feel strongly that this vote tonight will determine the battle, the, the, fisc the battle between Republicans and Democrats. And that is wrong to bring that into city legislation. And that is my, my biggest problem with this. Getting into the resolution, um, I do, understand the state is broke and the, the fifth whereas um, regarding the collective bargaining, listening to Governor Walker, the understanding that I get out of it as an independent is collective bargaining. If we don't restrict collective bargaining, then if we get a 8.8% reduction in retirement, then the fear is that the unions will just come back and ask us for concessions somewhere else or give backs somewhere else, which can ultimately still stifle our local budget. That, that's a concern of mine. I would love to be able to collective bargain, and I, I think the unions hopefully would come to the forefront. It's a little bit of concern of mine, but um, that's not a sh showstopper. The, Next, whereas um, the talking about the $14 million to our local economy, as a plant manager of a $12 million facility in 2009, I had to let 40 people go. I had to remove um, 401k employee matches. I had to do very tough things to make a company survive that now is thriving today because of the cuts we made in 2009 to survive. To me, that whereas in this doesn't get us anywhere. I mean, the fact of the matter is the state budget is broken and it needs to be fixed. So I personally would like to see that whereas taken out. 
the next whereas I don't think is is necessary um, whether the union dues and cert certification that's really not important to, to me what drives this the importance in what I would support in this resolution is the fact that the current transit issue is what the city should be talking to the state about this other stuff is all ancillary and it's stuff that ultimately needs to be done so if if we w would be willing to amend the fifth sixth and seventh whereas is and really focus on the transit issue and the fact that that has the biggest impact on why the city of stevens point would fight for this i would be in complete support a at this point i just you know i i really don't feel like it's our job to determine by this vote who is a democrat and who is a republican and I, I, I need to comment on that because as you know, as you and I talked about extensively, which is exactly why Mr. Weez is flat wrong, um, this was exactly the reservation why I did not put this in front of the Common Council as a resolution until today. Obtrusively using the Common Council as an overtly political mechanism is not something that I normally do. And it's not something that I normally support. It's not something that I think we normally would do in a day in, day out situation. So from that point of view, I, I totally agree with you. And that's why I was acting independently as the mayor, issuing my statements, working with the legislators as best I can, trying countless times to get a call into the governor's office to engage in a dialogue, working with the league to reiterate what our stance was and what we wanted. Um, we really asked as a league, which in essence is your main lobbying arm as a common council, we asked as a league for one very important change, not elimination, not evaporation, but change to Mead Arb in particular. Mead Arb is the mediation arbitration law and it's very specific. Under binding interest arbitration, prohibit an arbitrator from taking into account wage and benefit increases in other jurisdictions when choosing between the employer and the employee's final offer, the union's employee offer, uh, final offer, and specifically requiring the arbitrator to take into account local economic conditions. Local economic conditions need to be taken into account by an arbitrator because that would then be the objective measure within collective bargaining within the situation to fix the situation that you talk about. Plants uh, are closing. Plants need to be changed. Uh, employees need to be sometimes eliminated. It's very difficult. Those families have paid the ultimate sacrifice. You bet. I, I, I completely agree with you. Um, especially as a business owner, I know exactly how difficult those decisions can be. But this structure exists in a way where it can be modified and changed to still be responsive to the changing economic conditions, but not literally throw away all the collective bargaining aspects of this. And getting back to my initial point as to why I hadn't brought this forward, uh, Mr. Wiesa's request, with all due respect, is not why this is before you. The real situation that we face, especially with transit, as you highlighted, is the real reason why this is here. Because it is by far the most dire situation that we face that we, quite frankly, through more research done through public works and transit and arguably coming out of the state just a few days ago with the real highlights saying this is a severe risk to our federal assurances for transit funding. That's the reason why this is before you. So from that point of view, I completely agree with you. Uh, transit is the real issue why we're here. Collective bargaining is, is very much a close second because I think we can, as a governmental unit, maintain collective bargaining and do it correctly. Look at the way we've handled it. When we knew that we could pay 3% to our unions, we were able to do that and we did that. Look at the concessions that our unions had made. Look at the fund balance, especially for stop loss within our health insurance as to where we were prior to those concessions that they made. Look at where we are today. It's a different story. Those are called local economic conditions. Arbitrators could use that pro-labor or pro-management. That, that's a two-way street. But having that measure, which was part of these legislative priorities as being changing the system to be able to work within it, not throwing it out the window, is what the League has been advocating for. And that's why we took extreme offense as an organization when the governor and the administration said, well, this is what you asked for. It's not at all what we asked for. These legislative priorities are what we wanted to work through in a negotiated fashion to be able to bring to the table to talk about.
And that's what we don't have today. You know, if, you'd, if you would want to take out the whereas about the economic impact, I, I guess I, I could see that both ways. The real key is, and, and what I think the uniqueness of the one of the therefore be it resolves speaks to, is that I don't think any of us disagree with the fact that employees need to pay their Wisconsin retirement system contribution. I think that makes complete sense. And quite frankly, coming out of the private sector and coming into the public sector, when I reviewed my first budget and I asked the comptroller, uh, why does this say employee contribution, but we're paying all of it? That doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. But the impact of that on discretionary income is extreme and it has to be respected and at least recognized as part of this equation. That's why the 24 month uh, language is in the be it further resolved that we try to find a way to at least recognize as a governing body that we should pay that, that we feel we as elected officials who pay that and other public employees should pay that. But we'd like to see that graduated. To lessen the impact on those families, it doesn't help the 40 families that you changed immediately. And I respect that, I really do. But if there's a way for us to lessen the impact on those budgets and also financially, more importantly, on the overall local economy, if we can lessen that impact, I think it's an appropriate measure to take. And part of that, in reference to shared revenue reductions, is that we would take our reductions, which we have to. The governor, uh, in many ways, has nowhere to go but to look at schools. I see Jeff Presley back there. Schools and local municipalities. That arguably is where a lot of that money can be saved. So we also have to recognize that we can't say that we should take no cuts. Because we have to. We have to change the way we do business to modify with changing economic times. It's true. But the more flexibility that we can get and the longer the period of time for us to prepare for that is going to be helpful. Um, so I think the, the real issue here revolves around um, certainly the transit, I, I don't disagree with you, um, and uh, the collective bargaining part of that because it is interrelated with the transit specifically because of the language in the U.S. Code. So Mr. Trebatusky had your hand, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Romero followed by Mr. Trebatusky. I find it in just have to depress that there. It's all well and good that we're talking about our... A little closer. A little closer. It's all well and good that we're talking about the economic uh, impact to each one of us. But I think that uh, the situation we're on really goes to more than that. Uh, people probably can get away with a little less money. We're talking about rights, and they, uh, the, the rights for the dignity of uh, working people should be paramount, and we should uh, uh, heed them. Uh, the uh, Archbishop Lestecki, who's the head of the Wisconsin Catholic Conference, uh, pointed out that since 1895, uh, Catholic Church doctrine has said that the workers have a right to dignity have a right to a, uh, a union and that uh, there is a moral imperative to protect those rights and that hard times uh, do not nullify the moral obligation each of us has with respect to the legitimate rights of workers. We can talk all we want about, uh, you know, we're going to lose money here or lose, lose, lose money there, but the dignity of the people who work for us and who are our, our, our neighbors. I think that's what we should really uh, be looking at here. The, uh, you know, gas prices uh, might go up to $5 a gallon right now because we're having trouble in Libya and we'll all take a hit on that. But that's not as, that, that uh, pales by comparison to people losing their dignity as human beings. And that's what we're dealing with. I think one should read the uh, labor law of even the state of Wisconsin when Governor Randall uh, ordered the National Guard to shoot down uh, uh, and shoot at men, women, and children and kill them, including a 13-year-old child in uh, Milwaukee in uh, 1880. That's why we have this stuff. And uh, people say, well, 
Uh, you know, my pocketbook is important, but I think our ability to live in dignity is much more important. I will be supporting this. There, there may be uh, clauses that I would uh, fiddle with, but I won't. I think uh, the overall deal is we have to stand for the rights of individuals. In our uh, lifetime as uh, city legislators, it doesn't come up very often, but it came up tonight, and I think we should step up to the plate. Okay, other comments? Mr. Trebatuski? Um, I don't know if our, my counterpart, uh, Alderman Moore, um, he had concerns for that eighth whereas paragraph, uh, the bottom of the fir first page of the resolution. Um, if that was just the wording or the, some of the numbers perhaps too. But I do have a uh, 2010 transit system public funding sources appendix that was supplied by the state. And in 2010, the federal share was $771,587. The state share was $295,955. And those, you know, considering our ridership has been increased, costs have increased and everything, the numbers that the, uh, that they have in, we have in the resolution of $782,000 and per year and $290,000 9,000 per year are very adequate and very proportionate and very reflective of this report that I have in my hand. Other comments? Yes, President Strike. Um, just a comment. I never said anything about taking away somebody's dignity or their rights, but sometimes you have to sacrifice a little to stay alive. And had I, in 2009, had my company not made a decision to look at 40 employees in the face with dignity and tell them that we no longer needed their service, 160 employees would be out of work probably today or, or be doing it. So I never said anything about dignity. Um, it's about repairing the budget and, and that's what my basis of this on. The transit, I believe, is very important, but as you and I even talked, right now the Republican stance at the state is that their lawyers don't believe the funding would disappear. We have, so we have some attorneys saying that it won't be affected, and we have some attorneys saying that it will be affected. And, and right now, I don't think there's anybody that can give a 100% answer. So I don't have a problem with a resolution saying, Governor, please consider this because you made this so fast. I don't think you considered the fact that we could lose these rights. That's asking them for a compromise. To throw this in, in my opinion, what we can't do as a city is alienate the state and, and have us looked at politically as a democratic city so therefore the Republican state government is going to decrease all of our funding in the future. I want a resolution that says exactly what the first four bullets exactly do saying we want to accomplish a lot, we want to work with you and we want to grow on the good things that we already have going. The transit one clearly says we are very concerned about a million dollars I think that is what we need to focus on, and the rest is ancillary. And, and I think that truly is the I think that truly is the focus of this particular resolution. Although the collective bargaining aspect of that, of course, is very is very central to that being one of those those main issues. The other thing that I want to talk about, which which really gets at a social justice element of why transit is so important to us is ultimately it, it is the focus and really the severity of why we projected this forward but you know seniors and disabled represent 25.8 percent of the rides or over 62,000 rides are from senior citizens and those who are disabled and even the idea that perhaps there might be a very round the bend sort of way that we could save the transit system by creating a separate authority but then trying to find some kind of a private entity if one would even exist or be able to function in 
an authority that would be as small as ours, you have to understand most of the time those work in large metro areas and not very, very small communities like ours. That's another concern that we have. Even if it might be able to be saved in different ways, is there the likelihood of being able to use that method in a community of our size? And that is a, a definite concern. Transit is a definite focus. Um, that's for sure. Uh, Mr. Mallison, followed by Mr. Moore, followed by Ms. Suomi. Uh, well, I just want to touch on a few things. Number one, I think us doing this resolution, I don't think it is politicizing the issue. There's many times on the county board that the legislative committee comes up with support or non-support of many bills. But one of the things I want to bring up, uh, without getting too politicized here, is the platform and the principles that candidates stood by and how our districts voted. There's not a district in the city that voted for these principles, in my opinion, that Mr. Walker is doing with taking away collective bargaining. As a matter of fact, there's not a district in the city where there wasn't over 100 votes spread between candidates. And I think we should follow what the voice of the people were near just over four can, months ago. Can you clarify uh, exactly what you mean? I'm not, I'm not quite following. Sure. Could you it, clarify that? I certainly can, Mary. When you look at what the results of the last election were in November, went for, for governor. Okay. There isn't a district in the city that Governor Walker won in. And I think it comes off of the principles and the platform that candidate stood for. And one of those was having unions and, and allowing them to collective bargain. And quite frankly, when you're getting beaten by 100 votes in every district, and some in, some in let's see here, in the 9th, over 200, in, in the 11th, over 150, in my own district, in, in the 1st, uh, over 250, I think that says something about how this community feels and the message this community wants. And before we get too politicized here and start having even even more back and forth, I am going to call the question. Okay, we have um, a motion to call the question. And we have a second, always in order. Uh, I don't believe we, do we vote on whether or not to call the question or do we move automatically to a vote? Automatically to a vote. Okay, we have, um, we have uh, Trebatusky seconding the calling of the question. Malison moved, Trebatusky seconded. Uh, the resolution has been presented to you. Uh, we'll move directly to a vote. Uh, Kirk will please call the vote. Mr. Mallison? Uh, I, I don't mean to, to uh, disagree with you, but I believe we do have to vote on calling the question. Am I wrong with Robert's Rules of Order? I just clarified that with the city attorney. He says we move directly to a vote without voting on whether or not to call the question. We traditionally have gone, when, some, when there's been a, a question call, We've, at, we've treated it as though it was um, such as a laying on the table, and we've moved to the question. Now, I don't have my Robert's Rules here with me this evening, so I, I may stand uh, corrected later. But in, in any event, unless there's appeal from the floor. Well, is there an objection? Absolutely. Okay, we have an objection by uh, President Stroik. Um, what we will do is we will vote on whether or not to call the question. The, the clerk's first call for the roll will be on whether or not to end debate and move directly to a vote on the matter. So the clerk, if you would, call the roll on whether or not to call the question. Do you want to clarify their aye versus nay? You're voting, if you vote aye, you are voting in favor of moving toward a final vote on the resolution immediately. If you vote no, you are in opposition to that. More. No. Brooks. Aye. R. Stroik. No. Molsky. No. Trevitesky. Aye. Slowinski. No. M. Stroik. No. Wiesa. No. Omira. Aye. Su Suomi. Aye. Mallison. Aye. Okay, the Six. motion to motion to uh, call the question fails uh, on a 5-6 vote. Okay, so we will continue with debate. I believe Mr. Moore was next, followed by, uh, all, actually, excuse me, Mr. Moore. Um, Ms. Swomey, I believe you were next, followed by Mr. Moore. Ma'am, go ahead. Um, first of all, I, would, I want to say that I will definitely support this resolution. Um, if we as the city council pa passes this resolution opposing the proposed budget adjustment bill, besides taking a stance, how else will this city be using this resolution? That's one question. And the reason why I'm supporting this resolution is because 
it creates a collaborative environment. And I think that is truly needed, as well as the inclusive language for collective bargaining. Um, the question I have for our city attorney concerning this transit, if it actually, if this budget bill does pass, do we have any legal ramifications as a city to take? Well, when you say legal ramifications, are you speaking of whether or not we can uh, challenge the issue with the federal government or the state of Wisconsin? Uh, let, let, me put, let me say this. We are a creature of the state. When I say a creature, the city is a municipal corporation. Um, its powers come from, so to speak, the sovereign, the state of Wisconsin. What the state allows us to do, or permits, or um, prohibits the city from doing, uh, generally we, uh, unless it's totally unconstitutional based on the constitution of the state as it relates to municipalities, uh, probably we don't have a lot to stand on. Uh, can we challenge what the United States or what the U.S. Code provides? Um, sure, you can challenge it that, you know, within the factual basis, but not necessarily what the law is. So that if we think we now can fit within the parameters of uh, the particular transit section as it relates to um, the union issue through a third corp third party and a th third or a secondary authority assuming we have that authority from the state uh yes we we can argue that i'm not saying you can win it but um sure you can but it it makes it very difficult put it that way and, and i know there was a comment that the republicans attorney for, or I should say the Republican Party or the Republican um, uh, attorney for the governor has indicated that, well, they think we shouldn't have a problem. I guess I would just as soon see it that we didn't have a problem and that the legislation either carves this out specifically or the legislation um, uh, is such of such a nature that there isn't going to be a problem in the future. Now, that isn't necessarily our job. That is your legislator's job and um, the legislature as a whole to make those changes. Um, you have to, I know you understand the governor proposes the budget, but the legislature, not the governor, adopt the budget and that, or the, or the uh, budget amendments. That, of course, is the same as our mayor may propose a budget, but you still, as members of the council, adopt that. And Alderperson Swomey, if I could read just a couple things from the Legislative Fiscal Bureau and their analysis. As a general rule, federal labor law under U.S. Code 49, Section 13C, which is what we've referenced, protects transit employees who may be affected by federal transit funding. It requires the continuation of collective bargaining rights and protection of transit employees' wages, working conditions, pension benefits, seniority, vacation, sick and personal leave, travel passes, and other conditions of employment. It also requires paid training and retaining and retraining, excuse me, for employees affected by federal assistance. Section 13C requires the continuation of any collective bargaining rights that were in place when the employer started receiving federal funds. And you asked how this resolution is going to be used. I intend on personally delivering this to the desks of numerous legislators tomorrow, along with at least an attempt to deliver this by hand to the governor's office tomorrow as well. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions? Mr. Moore, I believe. Done? Mr. Wiese? When I sent that email to your office, I thought I had what was a clear resolution opposing the removal of collective bargaining. Yes or no? 
Uh, no mention of Democrats, no mention of Republicans, no mention of how many districts voted for who, and I don't care about that. My resolution opposed collect the removal of collective bargaining. The loss or potential loss of those transit funds, which by the way, I have to trust our city attorney. I don't care what other attorneys say. Louis is responsible for defending us as a city should this go to any kind of court. So I have to trust his word. Um, the, the loss or potential loss of those transit funds is a direct result of the loss of that collective bargaining. That's all I asked for. The administration changed this into something now that's taken, well, almost an hour to discuss. So I'm going to try something here, and I'm going to move amendments keeping only whereas number one, paragraph one, paragraph five, and paragraph eight. And the therefore be it resolved, the first paragraph. Now that takes out all the fluff. Basically what it's saying is that the city understands this financial situation the state is in, that Governor Walker's bill prohibits collective bargaining with any local government unit except for the public safety employees, and that because of that loss of collective bargaining, the whereas regarding the transit, potential transit money loss um, that Attorney Malevsky put in, we oppose the removal of anything that pertains to collective bargaining, and that those items not just be dropped, but that those said items be given separate consideration with public hearings, legislative committee markup, and deliberations in each house of the legislature. That takes it down to bare bones. Basically, we're saying we understand there's a financial problem. We oppose collective bargaining primarily because we stand to lose all of our transit funds, and we ask that those be given separate consideration. So that's my motion. Okay, which paragraphs do, do, are you, did you say in your motion that you want to I will, save key paragraphs or remove key paragraphs? We're going to keep, keep go paragraphs those again. one, five, eight, and therefore be it resolved, paragraph one. Okay, is there a second? Okay, seeing none, the motion fails. Okay, other comments or questions? Yes, Mr. Slowinski. Well, first off, test, am I on? Yes, I think so. Okay. Uh, first off, I just want to express my disappointment. I had one minute to read this when I got in here tonight. I don't understand why we couldn't have waited at least one more day I mean, just from listening to some of this debate tonight, yes, there's some things I agree with, some things I don't agree with. But I cannot support this until I have an opportunity to go home and dissect this thing and read it over. So with that being said, I will not be supporting this. Unfortunately, I, I wish there could be more time. But unfortunately, there simply isn't. Um, the, the ability for the state legislature to act, certainly within the next 24 to 48 hours, is, is upon us. So either we are going to take a very clear stand based on the whereas is that we have here and the, the therefore be it resolved, uh, which were not done arbitrarily. These whereas is were injected. The way you write a resolution and, and not just simply carbon copy another municipality's resolution is you write it in a way that speaks specifically to the concerns that you have and the concerns that you want to say that I feel and that this body would then feel by passing this would be uniform and very specific to this municipality. And the whereases that we have in here speak to justifying the reason for us acting. In other words, the whereases lay your foundation for ultimately ensuring what you're resolving to do. They, in essence, justify what the action is that you're trying to take. The, the risk for us to lose those transit dollars are extreme. Uh, the risk in and the correlated risk of the loss of collective bargaining as to why that would be so precipitous is laid out in these uh, in these whereases. Now, we have to admit that in in compromising, for example, which is why the second or I should say the actual first, be it further resolved, was put into this particular document, is that it recognizes, as we state in the the first whereas, that we understand the fiscal situation that the state faces, but at the same time. The flexibility that we could gain if the retirement contributions and the health insurance contributions were phased in, 
the lessening of the impact on the liquidity in the local economy would then be narrowed, but yet we're still making those concessions. The dollars are still available to help us as a municipality counteract shared revenue reductions, and they obviously would be there to help the solvency of the state at the same time. Uh, unfortunately, when you deal with a situation like this where you, where you literally have no other choice um, but to act in a very quick way, we have to work through a debate like this, and if we have to continue to work through clarification and talking about these things, we certainly should. And I want to be able to get you and Alderperson Moore and anybody else that has reservations here tonight to get to a sense of comfort in saying that we aren't opposed to everything that the governor is trying to do. In fact, we very much recognize the financial situation that the state finds itself in. The method and the way in which you solve those problems are really what we're getting at with this resolution. There should be further public hearings. There should be further dialogue. We shouldn't throw collective bargaining out the window. Indeed, we should work within it to try and be more responsive to changing times. And that's why the whereases that are in here, uh, and specifically the, uh, the resolutions uh, in the, um, the end of this document, speak very specifically to what we say we feel as a community is important. Uh, it's not just about collective bargaining. Collective bargaining is a big part of it, but it's a much greater picture that needs to be reflected in the official document that we would ultimately pass. And that's why uh, the wording that's in here uh, appears, and that was really a, a collective uh, conversation between the city attorney, the city clerk, uh, and myself. So. I wish there was more time. Unfortunately, there isn't. We're either going to go on record and say that this is not right, do the best that we can tomorrow to try and intervene directly with legislators to try and get them to listen to the practicality of what we're trying to say and to make a difference in Madison, or uh, we don't act and there's the likelihood that it, that it passes. But this is a way for us to take a stance. Uh, we don't have a legislative committee. Indeed, uh, quite honestly, as I've shared with you tonight, I probably was not going to bring forward this resolution until we really were able to wrap our hands around what the potential impact uh, was to the transit system. And that, I simply felt, had risen to a level of uh, concern that was great enough for us to be able to act as a, as a body. And that's the real reason why we're here. Mr. Trebatusky, followed by Mr. Stroik. Um, I might also want to add, you know, we have the, the be it resolves in here. Um, the governor has gone on the media numerous times and he has said that no one has brought forth alternatives. This is one of the alternatives of phasing it in. Um, there are other, other alternatives that could be dis discussed. Um, you know, not necessarily by us, but by the state regarding perhaps increasing sales tax. There are many other avenues that he can approach a, a budget shortfall, and, and they are not being discussed and being weighed at all. And, and I think that this, we need to put some type of pot potential alternative or solution in it, and, and therefore I, I think that this, uh, you know, re resolution as stated right now is a very good and very appropriate piece of paper. Mr. Strike. Yes, um, I understand the collective bargaining, um, and that is stated in paragraph eight. Um, exactly says Title 49 USC effectively requires the city to continue collective bargaining rights for the transit, which again to me is the most important thing the city wants to debate. I do agree with the now therefore be it resolved that the Stevens Point Common Council hereby request the Wisconsin State Legislator to delete provisions of the fiscal repair bill currently be considered pertain to collective bargaining. That's as a whole. To me, I am going to make a motion because I think collective bargaining is very clear in the whereas number eight and what we want to see as a a compromise in the first where it be resolved. So I will make a motion that I hope would pass is that we eliminate paragraphs five, six, and seven and pass the resolution as it still states, effectively telling our stance on collective bargaining and where it be resolved what we want to see happen. Okay, do we have a second? Okay. That motion fails. Okay, we're back to the original motion. Any other comments or questions? Or we probably are getting very close to a vote would be my guess. Any other comments, questions, or clarifications? Mr. Brooks? I guess I, I feel like I have to say one more thing at least before we go to a vote. I know 
we want to stay away from um, making this a political debate or anything else, but I know that I know that we are I'm, I'm representing the city here in, in some of these whereas definitely, but I also feel that we're representing the voices of those people that are in our city and I, that's why I feel some of these other things are necessary. The, I mean, I, again, I'm not going to pull out numbers uh, like um, Alderperson Mallison did, perhaps, but it, it's, it's very clear that we had, I, I feel that I am supporting the beliefs of my district in which I represent by supporting these whereases in here. And that's why I'm going to vote for this. They need to speak, and unfortunately, like myself as a citizen, I feel like I don't have a say in this. You have thousands and thousands of people going down the mass and trying to have a say, and we have someone not listening. Well, I, I assume that a, a body of government is going to have a bigger voice than them. So hopefully we can do something for those voices of the citizens of Stevens Point by, um, by approving this resolution tonight. Okay, any other comments or questions? Mr. Strike. I, I just want to make this clear to my constituents um, that I fully believe that the the issues are with the transit, which are the reason the transit is an issue is collective bargaining. I do not feel that we, the, the state is broke, the budget is broke, we need to fix it. And because we can't, to, to me, because we want to throw in that Portage County is going to lose $14 million minimum, that's irrelevant. When I had to look 40 people in the face and tell them I could not keep them employed, I could not make a decision based on what my heart felt. I had to make a decision for the other 120 people that were employed. And by us throwing those three whereas is in there, we are ignoring the real need and the, the real issue that the state is broke. So I believe in collective bargaining. I believe in the entire resolution except for bullets five, six, and seven. And, and because there is no compromise within the council, I will be voting no. Okay, any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, clerk will please call the roll. Mallison. Aye. Suomi. Aye. Omira. Aye. Wiza. Aye. M. Stroik. Aye. Slowinski. No. Jabotesky. Aye. Molski. Aye. R. Stroik. No. Brooks. Aye. Moore. Okay, by a vote of 8-3, the resolution is adopted.